Okay. Hello, everyone. The title of today's episode is The Freedom from Self Simulation. My observations have taken me to the consideration that, you know, the human intelligence finds itself on a rock in the middle of nowhere as a reaction to the massive emptiness and meaninglessness the the species uh, took to the strategy of language acquisition. And we're now living in a time where it's easier to be in a conditional story, in a known conditional story, than an unknown, uh, unconditional experience. The freedom from self-simulation suggests that the human attention wonders about what is being simulated in the moment, what can even be known to be simulated, and if there are simulations or is any sort of simulation in the moment, what can the attention do? The human being has access to multiple angles of self-perception. We can consider our sense of self in context to as many things we can see. The human mind has been so fascinating that even this concept of personification exists, where human beings look at something that is uh, inanimate and we see the animate qualities of a person. This extends from Disney movies to, you know, types of poetry. For example, the poet Rumi, the Sufi mystic from 700 years ago, he tried to depict lovers through the metaphor of a moth and a candle. And so it's like as the story goes, there's this moth that is spinning around this candle endless nights. And this moth and the candle flame are like lovers. And so one night, the moth's wing uh, hits the candle flame. And then as the moth is falling, you know, in some sense, you know, the tragedy of love, as the moth is falling, the moth looks at the candle flame and says, all these nights I have, uh, as if the moth is imbued with the humanized qualities similar to the candle, the moth says, All these nights I have been spinning around you, keeping you company in the void. How could you burn me? And then the candle flame speaks, again given a personification, the candle flame says, How all these nights I have been shining bright to keep you warm. How do you, why, uh, how would you think that I would burn you? Right, so it's this sort of, anyways, human humanization given uh, to the nature of phenomena, phenomena which otherwise wouldn't be human. The nature of a simulated reality is important because something we know, especially about the human ego, is that the human ego is constantly scanning the moment to re-identify what is important. Telling someone, you know, they're in a simulation is like telling someone their efforts are, are meaningless, you know, where they are actually nowhere, right? It's like imagine someone working on a project and suddenly... A sort of hollowness is witnessed. I think what's important is to consider that if there is self-simulation, to what degree is there self-simulation? And if there is a freedom beyond self-simulation, what could that freedom be? Right now, what I'm wondering... I'm pretty much wondering, like, what is simulated about the moment? So right now, in front of me on my balcony, there's this... Believe it or not, I bought these garden benches. (laughs) So I'm looking at this garden bench and... Pretty much I asked myself, okay, 
in this moment where I'm experiencing this object in front of me, what to what degree is this object simulated? <clears throat> I see that my brain is simulating the composure and the context to even observing that object. I could see that when, when I look at that object and it's a garden bench, that is pretty much self-simulation. What I'm trying to say is meaning is simulated. <clears throat> especially when there's unconscious moments it's like the person has problems has suffering the person is seeking enlightenment then the person goes to sleep and in deep sleep has like the most sound sleep as if there is no self to suffer or get enlightened in deep sleep as if human intelligence experiences states where there is no self to simulate anything <clears throat> this is of course in the deep dream state you know, excuse me, deep sleep state. In dream states, it is different. In dream states, it's very strange. It's as if the reality is not bound to physical observation. What I'm trying to say is that we need to observe what is being simulated in the moment. Meaning, the act of anything to mean anything is a sort of simulation. The nature of the human mind is that it's an energetic of effort. That means, sure, on some level, the person wakes up in the morning and we're like, okay, we see a person, uh, <coughs> a character in a sort of story going about the day, right? We choose to zoom in on the persona. But on some level, if we, just for a second, if whoever you are listening to me, for a second, consider if the species hadn't discovered language. It would just be a physical entity moving in, in a physical space. That's it. On, on, you know what's really bizarre? <coughs> People uh, are conditioned and enchanted by language to have a sort of narrative for the world to survive through and of course it makes sense but what is actually happening doesn't need to be let's say sub pinpointed by language it's like a genetical program on the surface of a planet its major priority being the continuity of experience It's kind of like our effort <coughs> simultaneously upon how the moment is happening leads to the simulation of our identity. You know, seeking freedom from a simulation is, is similar to <coughs> wanting to be free from a world that was never there. It's just the nature of how our intelligence is held. You know, one of the biggest, uh, I would say one of the most fascinating things about the human being is that we cannot identify ourselves in a changing system. And the only reason languages has been able to, we've been able to use it, is because we're changing slower. Think of it this way, that <coughs> uh, if the ground underneath my feet was changing faster than I could walk on it, there would be nowhere to walk. Because our changes are slow and observable, language has something to be applied to. Reality is fascinating, you know. I sometimes, in, in 
in talk, certain talks of mine I've spoke about it where in the future there will be technology where a child is born and the parents will have a choice of requesting when they want their child to wake up in the actual earth so it would be as if imagine a child is born the body the nutrition all of this is preserved but the child is at its brain let's say is connected and awakens into a cyber reality first <clears throat> so imagine you living 30 years of life in cyberspace and then something happens you die in that life and then you wake up in reality and you're like 10 years old imagine so I'm saying it would be like a 10 year old biological entity with like a 30 year old cyberspace memory, you know. The idea is that we are in the game of self simulation. So the greatest thing we can do, <coughs> excuse me, not the greatest thing, but something that can be done is to seek, uh, seek a controlled self simulation. When I want look at my biological body, I ask myself, why is it that my consciousness enables me to raise my hand in the air, but I can't stop my heartbeat, or I can't, you know, move the currents in my body in a different way, you know, like, <clears throat> there was a very transcendental scene in, in, the, in, the, in the film, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon at the end, where the master is like poisoned, and the dude's like trying to with his consciousness and concentration you know move the flow of his blood a different direction so like the you know poison doesn't you know move slower in his body <clears throat> like the person was that conscious of their physical existence you know just like a person can move their hand that character could move his blood you know the currents of his blood but what I'm trying to say Is that why is consciousness capable in, so, in a certain dimension and in other dimensions why is it unconscious you know like I understand that when I look at physical reality what it means to me is an act of my own self simulation <clears throat> but when I look at how the world is here why is it here or the person is like you know they realize like particles let's say were created due to certain laws in nature but why are the laws there you know the human humanity is kind of like <clears throat> like the human archetype is like putting your head out of a car window to check check like you know an environment before you park somewhere you know and that's a good question where is truth parked you know how does our attention accept reality and then maneuver and navigate in, in, the, in its simulation. Something I often do uh, in, when I come, let's say when I sit in the ivory tower of my ego's might <laughs> you know sometimes I, I just reset the moment and I go like okay what if everything I know is incomplete and what if everything my species knows is incomplete and what if our ob observation of reality is incomplete really humanity is trying to be completed in an incomplete world so many people seeking completion so many people thinking success means completion but completion where right it's it's as if there are corners to the universe we cannot see and we've already made assumptions that we're just physical beings it's, it's like <clears throat> there's something more here and humanity needs to revert to an earlier you can say patch of psychology <laughs> just like apps have patch updates you know How is our attention held in the moment? <clears throat> and what is being the human experience? That's the question. So back to the idea of simulations, right? So on some level, our mere movement effort 
uh, you know, projects the simulation. One thing we know, just like Frederick Nietzsche said, if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one to hear it, that the tree falls. So we require <coughs> a conscious agency, you know, plus space, plus a movement of shape in space. So a human being is like, okay, let's say I'm in a simulation. What is the simulation? And the simulation of perception Space, shape, substance, color, and wakefulness. It's like a simulation. If we wanted to create an ideological equation for it, it would be like simulation equals <coughs> unknown observer and, and uh, it would be pretty much like attention plus shape plus space plus movement can you imagine somebody's like i'm trapped in a simulation and they're like what's the simulation like and the person's like it's like a photograph you know it's like we're stuck in a photograph and we can't <coughs> uh, discover the nature of other frames of reality you know it's multidimensional. Our species has been scared of the unknown, so we've, you know, trapped truth in a sort of a, a linguistic position. In the future, right now, the simulations that human consciousness, uh, let's say, uh, needs to awaken from, it's like there, it's fewer than the future. Right now, it's kind of like we gotta wake up from the dream of language. We gotta wake up from the dream of, uh, let's say, <coughs> unnatural human behavior, and then we gotta wake up from the dream of nature itself. Right. So it's as if, like, you know, civilization is a simulation, the language is a simulation, and the ancient ancient yogis even perceived existence as a simulation <clears throat> but right now in 2022 human beings are like no we gotta put re we gotta plant the flag of reality somewhere and so we plant the flag on existence and now we have to wake up from our subjective simulation upon what reality is right but in the future they might have to wake up from cyberspace so that means first simulation elemental second simulation idea uh, let's say uh, behavioral third simulation uh, la linguistic language oriented and fourth simulation cyber oriented based on the worlds we accept you know uh, we create the dimensions to our being There's a story <coughs> from this ancient text called the Mandukya Upanishad. In the Mandukya Upanishad, uh, so I'll just read it, it says two birds, inseparable companions, perch on the same tree. One eats the fruit, the other looks on. The first bird is our individual self feeding on the pleasures and pains of his deeds. The other is the universal self silently witnessing all. And guys, you know, th this, this thing I just read about the Mandukya Upanishad, let me tell you something that's very bizarre but incredible that's written in the Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> and the Bhagavad Gita is to me it's it's like a transcendental book right now we're living in a humanity where there's transcendental bo books you believe that 
you know <laughs> for me personally I'm a bit bit of a maverick and for me all religious revelation is also equivalent to if a time traveler came back and wanted humanity to behave differently how would it for me religions are actually from the future but people don't understand they couldn't understand its significance so it had to be defined and colored by the past <coughs> but anyways in the Bhagavad Gita, there's something bizarre. I remember when I read it, I was like, what the fuck? Like, I, <laughs> it was one of those things where I would say, like, you know, reading something that's so out, out of... Okay, anyways, I'll say it. In the Bhagavad Gita, which is a story of pretty much the avatar of God called Krishna t speaking to this archer in the middle of a battlefield. <clears throat> pretty much enlightening this archer in the middle of a battlefield who doesn't know what to do. And so, at some point, the archer asks about truth, and Krishna, this avatar of God, the avatar of, of the ultimate truth, begins to tell him that they're human beings. <coughs> it's like this, that it's like, pretty much there's two types, right? And see it in, in, in contrast to, like, think of it this way, there's some human beings that have understood their universal self, and some human beings that have un are still lost in the understandings of their individual self. <coughs> what the Bhagavad Gita was saying is that, let's say a human being has not understood their universal self, and they do meritorious deeds, they do good actions, right? So after this lifetime, their consciousness will go to the moon, and inside the moon, they will experience the paradises, the rewards of their deeds as paradises. And after <clears throat> that, uh, their, uh, the reward of their deeds has been returned. It's as if they reincarnate back to the earth. You know, it's kind of like human beings on earth seek heaven, but because they think they're an individual entity, in the afterlife, their consciousness goes to the moon. They experience paradises and then they come back you know reincarnate so it's another way of saying <clears throat> it's like you were trying to uh, complete a video game level and instead you completed the video game level you went and got rewards but you came back to the same level as if there was something else that had to be done and so the recognition and how the Mandukya Upanishad says this like it's a metaphor for one's nature pretty much <clears throat> the ego the the shaped sense of self in the simulation of the present moment that's kind of like uh let's say the part of you that is uh an animal that is reacting <coughs> or responding to pleasure and reacting to pain okay so there's that sort of individual selfhood and then there's also the other bird that is watching the first bird eat fruit which is another way of saying right now as i am speaking for example, <clears throat> my personality, this archetype of Mr. Within this online alias, it's, it's, it's as if this is my individual self's doing. Okay, so it's like right now I'm giving a talk, but that which is silently witnessing within me that I am expressing something as a being is on a universal context basis. So it's as if those who get <coughs> attached to the concepts in life they do not realize that the context is free because the context is a start from the void people don't understand this you know imagine there's somebody and they do something and a group of people come and tell this person you're a loser man and a group of people come and say to the person you're a winner but and imagine the person's like how do you know i'm a loser how do you know i'm a winner and the questions go back to how in the middle of nowhere meaning took shape and was accepted so there is an there is a state that is almost like about how would I say it? it's like an instantaneous state where the person <coughs> is actually non-dual. By the way, guys, welcome to welcome to uh, the episode in the chat section. If there's questions or things anything that viewers think my attention needs to go to let me know pretty much uh, 
what a simulation is is a dream and it's very hard for human beings to after accepting reality to be such a physical real thing to be like wait a minute could life be a dream <coughs> and imagine somebody has dreams in life it's as if it's this person having dreams in a dream you know <laughs> and imagine somebody's dream was awakening the person's like i've been dreaming for years to awaken but somehow i'm still dreaming you know, the nature of it is uh, the capability <coughs> of your own nature. I personally realized that there, in, there, in spiritualism, there, there had to be the sort of oral transmission of knowledge or technique or wisdom because there were no history books, there was no internet and whatnot, you know. <coughs> so people had to communicate, right? And even truth had to be communicated. But something I realized, and there's an episode, guys, there's an episode, uh, I think it's M, it's lecture code is MW438, okay? And this, this episode shows the first time I gave a public microphone kind of talk, right? <clears throat> and long story short, I was speaking about this concept of a guru and an enlightened master and it's, it's kind of hilarious because in the talk it was during 2016 where I visited Iran and you know they were having this sort of in quotation spiritual gathering you know <clears throat> and uh, at the end of it they asked me to speak and the speaker tells me that I you know I have 10 minutes to like you know just talk and I remember I finished it in 8 and before they called my name up all the other people they were like master this master that you know it was like <clears throat> in an egoist in an egotistic collective way you know i was i spoke in a room of in quotations masters <laughs> long story short i remember just shouting at the audience at some point that your the purpose of an external guru is to reveal to you the inner guru because if you follow the external guru, you're following the personality of a being you don't have the direct experience of, right? So the idea, the purpose of the external guru was to be a mirror. And once the individual realized it's like the guru is an observation of the nature of how the mind is being in the moment rather than a specific character in a story, right? So the idea is that from <coughs> external simulations and convictions of an individual entity were it, it caught in the tornado of pain pleasure attachment detachment it's like for how long do we want to be a bewildered beast roaming the space-time continuum you know a desire bound beast at some point the human species takes a step back to realize in in what other way it can step forth <coughs> We are living at a time in history which is hilarious. Like probably in a time span of 100 to 200 years, there's going to come an incredible psychological shift. Just like how mind-blowing uh, technological, let's say exponential technological acceleration is. In the inner realms, we're going to have a completely different psychological being. The future generations are going to laugh at everything we cried about in 2022. Because what else can the future do? If we in 2022 identify with our limitations, the future is like only the limitless is left. I feel that the more this creature has become conscious of itself, the more it has positioned its story of self to one of ever-present victory. I feel this is really the calling of the soul, right? It's as if like <clears throat> inside an individual simulation, uh, how is the individual's truth energetically being present where the collective truth is? There's something I say in these talks where part of me kind of like 
finds it humorous but you know just like back in the day people were worshipping idols <clears throat> in 2022 we laugh at the idol worshippers of long ago but we don't realize we are ideologically worshipping reality so pretty much the effort behind these talks is to tell the viewers what if you're not an idea what if how we exist now is not a quality of an individual being but it's a quality of a universal presence because for how long can we keep up the masquerade of the human idea it's it's more sophisticated than that And it's super incredible, you know, some people are, they're looking for spiritual experiences and there's some people who the nature of just how their eyes are open in the world is like the mo most spiritual experience you, you can get, you know, <clears throat> the person's like, <laughs> imagine someone asking you, hey, if you had spiritual experiences and the person's like, yeah, man, every time I open my eyes, the world is there, you know. <laughs> a person finds individual salvation let me tell you it's like think of it that there's an individual uh, heaven there's an individual hell and think of it that there's a collective heaven and collective hell now the way uh, it seems to how the mind works at least <coughs> let's say in this parallel universe of earth Because communication and the conveyance of reality from in different inner realms, it's like our minds are living in a parallel universe, but our bodies are found in a singular universe. The mind is, is parallel in, in nature because a person can just remember the past and it's like, whoa, did my attention live yesterday, today? The individual heaven and hell and the collective heaven and hell, this is how I have observed it. Where a person starts off in an individual hell, then they, in some sense, mature into realizing, becoming responsible for their individual heaven. Now, after, when you, this individual heaven is in Buddhic thought considered uh, as nirvana, enlightenment, or the idea of Buddha mean, means the awakened one, right? The Buddha, Buddha is not the guy's name. The dude's name is Gautama Siddhartha. You know, people are like, yo, we're going to call you Buddha from now on. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, Buddha means awakened one, one who has awakened to the nature of their individualism. Okay. Now, in my view it, it's like once you overcome surpass the individual hell the unconscious let's say loops of reality of the individual and you come to the individual heaven this is where it gets really interesting because once you find your individual heaven you're gonna notice everybody's collective hell okay so those who feel their individuals who are enlightened great you know pat yourself on the back and just notice the collective hell right <clears throat> and so the the idea uh, there's this idea of the bodhisattva archetype <clears throat> and the bodhisattva archetype is how would i say it? the bodhisattva is and being that its individual enlightenment is linked with its collective enlightenment. Its collective enlightenment was the salvation of the universal sector, right? That means after we have built the most advanced civilization, it's like continues the efforts towards the most advanced world. And you know, the most advanced thing we can do in the world humorously is to be it. And we are being naturally our world right <clears throat> this is the power of nature it's as if you're a member of the universe you don't have to pay to be a member of the universe you just are you know
know it's like the person's like how long does my cosmic membership last and it's like oh if the human lifespan is a hundred years you know <laughs> <coughs> you know i i realize that if i choose to have a dualistic perspective and something i forgot to say i'll just finish the last thought the bodhisattvic ideal is that the being, upon realizing the collective hell, realizes that there's a collective presence. And upon being a collective presence, eventually realizes the choice of the collective. It's like, the, it's like, how would I say it? <clears throat> if individual enlightenment was dependent on discovering the source of what makes us individual collective enlightenment is also based on the source of everybody discovering what makes us collective you know i when i look at history the game of knowledge is pretty much the creature opened its eyes it got scared of what it saw and other creatures in the realm were like okay man don't be afraid here accept this story as your ultimate truth <laughs> we've been f spoon fed language you know so we so our inner realms you know hilariously grow strong enough to cover the actuality of reality on some level, arguments can be made that it's important to keep the simulations of humanity there, right? Like an enlightened perspective could be that the simulation was never a simulation, so no problem at all, right? Another approach could be that, okay, the simulations are denying greater experience. How do we advance as a species beyond self, 8 billion self-simulations? And the idea is integration. You know, right now we're living in an era of individual eyes, and I, I, I'd give it you know, a couple hundred years where the era of collective eyes are going to begin. <coughs> in my inner realms, I envisioned a future. I saw something pretty much like a future event. And what I saw was that imagine you're walking in the street like 400 years in the future or something, uh, more than 400 years, but you're walking in the street and you're seeing like a group of 10 people walk towards you and then you raise your hand to say hi to them right and all 10 of them as if they are synchronized being in one mind say hi at the same time you know <clears throat> that would be an era of collective mindhood because to be a biological physical entity is intense right just like the people in 2022 look at the people who fought in the world wars and they're they go like man those were some tough people we'll never find people as tough as that now right similarly the future generations are going to look at us being biological human beings and they're going to be like man our ancestors were so tough they were just living you know <clears throat> in in, the, in a dualistic biological dimension only you know The species needs to behave bodhisattvically rather than buddhically. You know? <laughs> <coughs> you know, it's like, what do we do with all the enlightened people on the planet? You know, it's, it's just the enlightened societies left. Ultimately, an enlightened civilization. Because right now, the species doesn't have a tolerance to experience anything outside of the simulation it has built its content into. Somebody can, you know, let's say challenge me and say, okay, Mr. Within, you are talking about like collective enlightenment but on some level, you're you're reading quotes from the Mandukya Upanishad that are saying that, you know, there's the universal self is freedom and the individual self, let's say, is unfree. So if the universal self is already free, why do we have to do anything? And if a person approaches it in this way, <clears throat> then on some level, even if you wanted to, you can't do anything, 
right? For me, I, I ask myself, okay, how do I give purpose to shape? How do I give purpose to shape? And the answer is, okay, we use other shapes to identify a shape. That means what the dictionary is, is like <clears throat> images being translated into symbols and symbols, you know, being... <clears throat> it's pretty much we're using symbol, we're using shape to make sense of shape. But at the end of it, at the end of the day, we're like, okay, it's still all shapes, what do we do? And so what is the purpose? Purpose is another way of saying how should the conscious, where should all conscious effort go? Where should all conscious effort go? That's it. That means if we for a second forgot about the personalities of human beings, human beings would be just an energetic effort. You know, right now in 2022, the era where still language worship is happening, you know what it is? It's like the species is like a crowd of like lost people and they don't know where to go. So they're following whatever they hear or see in, in, immediately in front of them, right? The species needs to start with an acceptance of the universal witness as if the person's like, okay, if I have universal freedom, then why isn't that freedom recognizable individually? It's as if, you know, in the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha, before he died, like, he freaked out. He went into hysteria and his disciples were like, Buddha, why are you freaking out now when you're about to, like, ma samadhi out of here? And Buddha suddenly says, I have been mistaken. You know, this is the Lotus Sutra's version of how Buddha passes away. And so Buddha says... <clears throat> what Buddha says at the end of his life and Buddha says I have been mistaken telling people to get enlightened because the world has been enlightened from the beginning it's, it's another way of saying you who have been searching for truth endlessly whether in this lifetime or many lifetimes or whatever a similar uh, you know a film you want to find your soul in but <laughs> We have the opportunity to start free and then work with the simulation or we can start unfree and seek freedom till the end of time. That means what if right now the most advanced potential of intelligence is present in humanity? What if the advanced civilization <coughs> that let's say, you know, blue jays sing in the wind is like what if right now the future is already here as our dormant potential? Because the human species has played with the past. <coughs> Judgment, duality is pretty much a relationship of the past with the present. The person's like, or let's say the multidimensional beings, like, for how long are chaos and order gonna fight in front of me? For how long is change going to, you know, perform on the stage of my consciousness? At some point, the effort will come to do something you have never done before. This is it. And what that means is not per se doing something physically you've never done before. It's another way of saying you have been looking at your life from one angle of perception. What if this whole time there has been hidden angles, different ways that you can experience how you are being human? And if there are states beyond the human framework, how have we been just considering we are human? How have we been so ignorant to rather than creating a multidimensional spectrum of possibilities of, of the movement of intelligence just to lock it down in the certainty of just a sentence? You know? <coughs> you know? <laughs> It's kind of like, you know, 
in the middle of nowhere people are lost in their beliefs and somebody's like how have we thought we have the time to believe in a photograph when life is a changing film it's like you know it's like you get this feeling what is the species uh what should the species be doing that it's not doing now In the chat section, somebody suggests like the idea of love. Love is love is important. What I'm talking about is like <clears throat> I'm not saying like without love doesn't lead to a sort of supreme enlightenment. <laughs> in in yoga, the concept of yoga means to join, and it's it's as if the aim of meditation. It's like meditation stops, as Swami Krishnananda says, when the inser- inseparability of the individual activity and the cosmic activity is witnessed. For me, in, and also in yoga, there's like bhakti yoga, the, it's like a path to enlightenment through love. There's raja yoga, a path to enlightenment through understanding or knowledge. You know, there's karma yoga, a path to enlightenment through work, right? And then there is uh, jinani yoga, which is it's, it's like through specific practices, right? It's fine, whoever you are, it's totally fine to love the world. But the idea is that the human being cannot trust reality if some part of it knows that what it's seeing is not the only thing. One of the, uh, I would say, heirs of the pro- of civilization 1.0 being the first prototype to human civilization has been that it has just judged dualistically. <clears throat> Imagine in the future they teach children that instead of you could just be good or bad, it's like you could be the mo- this consciousness and present in the moment could be dualistic, which is the good and bad. It could be singular, it could be void, and it could be infinite. That sound is from outside, guys. I can't do anything about it. (sighs) You know, duality is not enough. That's what's happening. It's not enough just to be a good person anymore, and it's not enough to just be an evil person. Like, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, these archetypes are outdated. Right now, we need a new, advanced approach of the human being. You know, at least the viewers get to hear how, you know, the sound of construction is in Octobico, Canada. (laughs) You know, guys, I hired a construction company to exactly make noise right when I'm about to give this talk, you know, right in the middle of my talk. So, you know, it adds effect. Yeah. Somebody in the chat section says, I said archetypes are outdated. Can you elaborate more there, please? Yeah, um, I, I, the, uh, the reality's judgment on meaning is that it's right or wrong. If it's uh, uh, true or false, this is dualistic in nature.
what an archetype is is how your attention has taken shape or in what sort of iron man suit of an ideology your attention has moved in okay that's what an archetype is <clears throat> every time i give these talks i've created for myself okay you know i'm someone speaking to the species i enter that archetype and then i find the emotions that come with it a sort of freedom in the moment you know but what I noticed is that, like, check this out. Let's say we are a multidimensional being, but so far it's as if, like, physical creature and unconscious self, right? It's like part of the earth separated from itself. This object has been moving, and as it has been moving, it has attained self-awareness, and at the same time, it has an accumulation of memory right and the nature of reality is like due to there being light and darkness it, it's as if good and evil is like you know the context uh, uh to the physical world that's been echoing in our minds okay <clears throat> so now i'm saying when a person realizes this construction noise is too loud i can't even hear the music my headphones like <laughs> Due to the duality, okay, due to the condition of duality in the outer realms right the whole fear and pleasure psychology is developed in man now i'm saying what if beyond duality which the archetypes are usually in and and think of it this way an archetype is a sense of self and a sense of self exists in accordance to a separation from a world It's like, maybe I should say it this way, imagine someone comes up to you and says, are you nothing? And the person's like, no, I'm not nothing. <laughs> and then the person comes and says, are you everything? And the person's like, no, I'm not everything. You know, and then the person comes and says, are you dualistic? You know, are you two things? And the person's like, no, I'm not two things, you know? <laughs> and then they come and ask the person, are you infinite? And that's where the answer becomes maybe. Maybe this whole time energy poetically cannot be created. I shouldn't say poetically, but let's say technically cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes form to form. Energy is like an, like a an similar word to soul, right? And I'm just saying life is so conditioned to identify with the observed that we never wonder if the observer could be different than how we thought we had to start, you know? <coughs> I've had moments where... I've been like embarrassed in the outer realms, okay? <laughs> and there's been moments where I have been embarrassed in the inner realms and that's pretty much it's like li uh, living in a version of the world that suddenly I realized was like a sinking ship you know if the species agrees that honesty is important in being a foundation for reality and utter honesty we don't know what we are right so if we don't know what we are where does the obsession to be something specific come from you know i i shared this story i had designed you know on, uh, i was talking to my brother about making a script making it into a sort of film script you know but pretty much it's this idea that the grim reaper comes to this enlightened guy <laughs> Right, and the Grim Reaper is like, buddy, time's up, you gotta go, you know, 
and then the person says I can't go right and the Grim Reaper says what do you mean it's your time to you know yeah it's like uh, <clears throat> you know it's your time to die and the person's like I can't go because I can't die right and then imagine the Grim Reaper being like what do you mean you can't die and the person's like I'm not <laughs> I'm a self uh, excuse me I'm not an individual self from the beginning I have been the presence of the awareness that is the space where my mind finds a, finds a movement in it. <coughs> what I'm trying to say is that when there is no idea of a self, technically it's like we don't know what is dying. <laughs> Anyways, I'll say it this way. We're a creature that opens its eyes in a world and really how it lives its life is, life is in accordance to the strategies it adopts, right? And so as one person, you know, among 8 billion human beings on this planet, the approach I have for is like I'm saying, okay, there's an outer realm and there's an inner realm. And at the same time, I am aware of the outer realm and inner realm ex being in the same moment. So the strategy to the outer realms is that we find ourselves in the human framework. So the human framework's advancement is the strategy of the outer realms. <coughs> when we look, experience ourselves in our inner realms, you know, it's, it, my purest experience is that I am sight as space. That means my, in my, my earliest memories, uh, I am not a self yet. Like I have a memory before I was a person right and I was just like this kid in a room just watching uh, the moment it was it was more like a visual uh, no ideology yet kind of memory of, of, of my childhood you know second guys I gotta charge my laptop I would let me let me just start off with from this idea that we find ourselves in a simulation what can we do we can either get out of the simulation we can choose to stay in the simulation we can choose to break the simulation or we can choose to see we were never in the simulation that is the fastest approach to realize we're not in a simulation you know, it's like the person searching for truth and in the middle of it is like, wait a minute, what is searching for truth? And it's like, it's, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. A person can believe in nothing. Let me say, let me just say this. A person can believe in nothing. A person can believe in uh, everything or something. A person can believe in... Uh, let's say two things and then a person can believe in infinite things
let me just Google this, guys. Let me just Google, you know, how to escape out of a civil war. <laughs> I think the simplest answer is uh, look behind your eyes to discover the nature of everything in front of you. website it says the best Upanishads quotes by Shankara Shankara but that's not nice actually I'm looking for okay here quotes from the Mandukya Upanishad so okay okay so this is not from the Mandukya Upanishad, actually what I'm going to read, but it's like how, uh, oh my god, sorry guys, I gotta keep looking for the website, Okay, so these quotes seem to be from the Mandukya Upanishad. It says, uh, Jesus. <laughs> Pretty much the quotes I'm looking for, they're quotes that are pointing to uh, the nature of the witness. Maybe even the Avaduta quotes would work here. Uh, okay, here, I'll read one quote. It, <laughs> in, in the Avaduta Gita, uh, Gita <laughs> it says, He who has filled the universe, he who is self with the capital S in self, how shall I salute him? To know the Atman as my nature is both knowledge and realization. I am He, there is not the least doubt of it. No thought, no word, no deed creates a bondage for me. In the Avaduta Gita it says, O oh mind, why are you so deluded? Why do you run about like a frightened ghost? Become aware of the indivisible self. Be rid of attachment. Be happy and free. So it's kind of like if the condition of our suffering is based on what we have attached ourselves to by becoming aware of an indivisible self how could there be an attachment it's like before the self got enlightened the view of the self and the world kind of went away it's a you know mysticism is a reversion but it, it's a it's a way of uh after you have experienced your known self getting a sense of the unknown self imagine right now everybody's living a known life and everybody's living an unknown life that's it <laughs> after we have mastered our known life our unknown life remains.
the sound of the con construction noise, guys, is so beautiful. I, I'm just, you know, stunned into silence. <laughs> If we realize that behind our eyes, what is living in the moment, what is the life of the moment, is not an idea or an object, then what happens is a pure, true faith in the whole moment, right? So a person lets go of all ideology, go finds a moment, sits still and silent. The inner effort stops for anything to happen in the outer realms. It's as if we get to see the original earth and then our trust is established that way. If the nature of the brain is that energy is being used to simulate meaning to motivate the biological movement, It's like a singular purpose is not sufficient for a multidimensional being. We're not, uh, to, to, you know, how would I say it? For what we are to call itself the human species, it has to ignore everything else it could be to some degree. You know, there's this ancient quote, I don't know who it's from, but it says, uh, to err is to be human. <clears throat> that means it's natural for human beings to make an error. But what if to be human is the error? And what I mean by that is like the type of human being we're being. It's like 50% of life, the story of life is uh, happening within us. I think it was Noam Chomsky, he said something like 99%, 99.9% of language use happens internally. A lot of what we do with language is actually occurring behind our eyes rather than in front of it. So imagine a species no longer convinced by the stories of the past enters a new present. And from that new present explores towards the future. The meaning of life is not per se just a human response to its circumstance you know it's just realizing there's more unknown variables than known variables and then a sort of freedom establish this establishes you know who was it there was this guy who went on dragon's den <laughs> and the person was um I think it was talking to one of the dragons who was like one of the investors who was uh, you know was hairless <laughs> and so 
this an investor asks the guy why did you come up with that that evaluation for your company and the guy says if me and you if you had a bar of gold and i had a hamburger and we were trapped on an island it's as if would the hamburger be more valuable or the bar of gold that means when you come to this realization that we're actually in an unknown universe and language is has been a reaction a retaliation towards emptiness you come back to that simple universe it's like if move uh, if we are in a moving universe it's as if in what in, in, a, in a moving world it's like what world is movement in you know the movement in it's too bizarre existence is i think it's not designed to make sense it's designed to perform in a certain way really you know there's times where i think that the human species this like biological natural being we are as a creature you know journeys to the end of time advancing civilization all over the cosmos the universe right and then there's there's a moments where i feel what if being a human is a phase of nature Right, it's like being a human is everything for the person. But 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 in when in, in in regards to how much how nature progresses, you know, what if we are like in a transition? It's like we're in an airport waiting for a flight, and then we think the airport is our home, and we're like, why doesn't the airport feel like our home? You know, it's <laughs> you know, or somebody inside an airplane being like, why doesn't this airplane, why doesn't this simulation of reality, which my attention is piloting through, why doesn't this feel like home, you know? <clears throat> and really we are, uh, you know, a multidimensionality in flight. I was listening to a lecture from Buckminster Fuller and he was saying like how his childhood was so next level. <clears throat> Buckminster Fuller in his childhood he was like his mother at the age of three came and told him you know uh, you know people can't fly it's impossible for a person or anything to fly right when he was like playing with a toy in the air right and at the age of seven when Buckminster Fuller was seven years old the Wright brothers managed to achieve flight and it was one of those things that people didn't acknowledge, you know, as, as if it's like they did, you know, the Wright brothers didn't exist, you know. And then suddenly when it's reality, it began to be in some sense shared with the masses. It's like it's certainty arose, right? We are creatures. Like think about it. What the Wright brothers did was one of the most complex things in the history of civilizations. The Wright brothers were time travelers, guys. I'm convinced. Yeah. <laughs> People are gonna hear hear me after a while. Be like, okay, Mister Within thinks everybody's a time traveler. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what do you think about Gandhi? I'm like, time traveler. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and if somebody says, what do I think about the Buddha? The Buddha was actually someone who traveled beyond time. The universal self is a suggestion that the universe is not changing. It's, it's, it's like space is changelessly allowing matter to change in it. <laughs> is you know imagine <clears throat> imagine just like you know let's say a jedi turning on a lightsaber for the first time right it's like when we open our eyes in the day we are getting a sense to, of our direct attention you know something a lot of uh, you know you you see a lot of these enlightened gurus that preach love i you don't see them say in some sense that uh there is an ideological love which is conditional and then there's an unconditional love that unconditional love doesn't mean you're someone that loves something it's like you are love itself right <clears throat> that's the supremacy right so you know it's important to let's say 
love people, but to love the world means to be the world. And you're loving yourself in a sense. <laughs> it's like when I love myself, I don't know if I'm loving the whole universe or I'm just loving me. <laughs> It, the past is past, okay? The present is what we have to work with, and the purpose oh, that we put to the present is what it, what's going to happen in the future with how we use our energy now. The mind, you know, something that I think religion has had an influence on is that it has made, let's say, you know, many human beings take into consideration the idea of like an invisible judgment system right so due to the invisible judgment system the behavior of the human being becomes modified right however the, that urge within this intelligence that we are being that wants to know its origin i mean that's that's like the, i would say the second it's like if existence existing at all was bizarre enough it's as if now <clears throat> existence realizing it's existing is it even more bizarre in the outer realms my conclusion build an advanced civilization and the inner realms I would say my conclusion is the advancement of vision the advancement of vision means it's as if like <sighs> it's like discovering the nature of your mind is the space of your whole moment when you realize that something changes about the being you know, it's like the person being like, is my mind being everything right now? <laughs> Self-simulations are things that have extended out of the attention of, let's say, what moves that self. Uh, in the inner realms life can so many different relationships of movement can happen that don't exist in the outer realms okay so in the outer realms let's say a person can fly but in their inner realms they can envision themselves flying they can envision themselves be hovering in the sky they could envision their balcony being the edge of a sky city let's say <clears throat> in the year 2622 do you, you see what i'm saying the inner realms have a capability to not just conceptually move something in space but to shift the context which brings forth a new concept it's like let's say there's this type of exploration which is concept tunneling and there's a kind of exploration which is context tunneling you know it, behind our eyes we have a choice <clears throat> at least on how the simulation is received you know the quality of the simulation we're in you know that's at least our choice what kind of quality it has to be convinced just by the inner realms is like a lower resolution than to be convinced by the outer realms and then to just be to realize beyond your inner realms and outer realms that means it's it's like the same instantaneity that you are being a physical body with the sensation of existing in a moment it's like with the same instantaneous certainty you realize you have always known how your mind is being The mind is not an object that, you know, so it's like something non-physical is moving the physical. What is the brain doing? Taking sensory perception, you know, remod remodeling it through memory and then expressing it. I think it was in a 
in the earlier talks but um I said that uh if I remember correctly it's like right now our species we're in the experiencing that phase where the greatest revolutions and evolutions occur uh, in accordance to communication and the freedom of communication you know it's like they tell the human being all right there's a universal declaration of human rights every person's free but then you realize every person's view on reality is limited to their conditioning it's as if the environment has not just had a physical influence on us but has had a psychological influence on us You know, uh, uh, something that is, I would say, one of the biggest lessons of this lifetime for me is that based on, uh, let's say, how far honestly I can view something suggests how advanced of an archetype can appear. It's as if those who truly care for reality get to see it. If we, if every, if human intelligence was like an antenna picking up signals, honesty and dishonesty is like increasing the range. The more honest the person is, the more reality can simply be present. The more simpler reality is present, the complex one is discovering the how the complex how the complex arose. You know. Evidently, there's this Tibetan Buddhist sage called Milarepa, okay, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to read some of his quotes. I'm just going to go into a Tibetan Buddhist quote tunnel right now, okay. Um, <laughs> Milarepa says, when you run after your thoughts, you're like a dog chasing a stick. Every time a stick is thrown, you run after it. Instead, be like a lion rather than chasing after the stick turns to face the thrower one only throws a stick at a lion so the lion wants that means any karmic event that happens you know it's like stare at its source try to find try to see its source Milarepa says deep in the wild mountains is a strange marketplace where you can trade the hassle and noise of everyday life for eternal light. Milarepa says in the gap between thoughts, non-conceptual wisdom shines continuously. Milarepa says life is short and the time of death is uncertain, so apply yourself to meditation. Avoid doing evil and acquire merit to the best of your ability, even at the cost of life itself. In short, act so that you have no cause to be ashamed of yourselves and hold fast to this rule. Yeah, I mean, of course, we're all left with acting in accordance to the best of our ability, but the cost of life depends on what we are, right? I think what it is is that if we seek the most advanced possibility, 
uh, the most advanced, not just one step ahead, two steps ahead, but so far steps ahead that when we attempted to solve a colossal problem, we had solved so many mediocre ones, you know? Milarepa says, in the monastery of your heart, you have a temple where all Buddhas unite. says <clears throat> I have no desire for wealth or possessions and so I have nothing I do not experience the initial suffering of having to accumulate possessions the intermediate suffering of having to guard and keep up possessions nor the final suffering of losing of losing the possessions <clears throat> Milarepa says my religion is not deceiving myself says all worldly pursuits have but one unavoidable and inevitable end which is song <coughs> acquisitions end in dispersion buildings and destruction meetings and separation births and death knowing this one should from the very first renounce acquisitions and storing up and building and meeting and faithful to the commands of an eminent guru set about realizing the truth that alone is the best religious observances he's pretty much saying you know figure it out before it's too late Milarepa says all meditation must begin with arousing deep compassion Whatever one does must emerge from an attitude of love and benefiting others. If we were all trying to build an advanced civilization, it would already be this. Like, Milarepa says, take the lowest place and you shall reach the highest. Milarepa says, do not entertain hopes for realization, but practice all your life. Milarepa says if one stays too long with friends, they will soon tire of him. Living in such closeness leads to dislike and hate. It is but human to expect and demand too much when one dwells too long in companionship. Milarepa says the affairs of the world will go on forever. Do not delay the practice of meditation. Once you have met with the profound instructions for a meditation master with single pointed determination, set about realizing the truth. <clears throat> and I would say it's like we need a single pointed determination to, in some sense, realize what the species should do here. Right? We should wonder about the most advanced possibility of humanity. That means whoever you are, if, if you're wondering what Mr. Within is telling people to meditate on, meditate on how advanced the future can be until you are being it. Our mind, if it is not a subject, is left as infinite potential. Let's say somebody is cooking something and they they realize there's someone better on the planet who can cook than them, right? So similarly, it becomes... It's like we realize there's a more advanced way we can be, or we could have been this whole time. 
it's like the potential of the light bulb was there Edison just had to invent it or something because wouldn't it be more exciting if we were in an advanced world rather than an inferior one like the purpose of the mind is that it can see the advancement so it's like the poetically the purpose of the mind is to see advancement then advance so it's like observe advancement until the greatest advancement finds you and then in some sense it's like the performance of you know the greatest civilization of this universe exactly that's what we do we choose to uphold the highest ideal which is universalism with universal egos we we can we can solve so many planetary problems you know it's like identifying with one's shadow or with one's light identifying with inefficiency and the efficiency of how intelligence is happening at all and based on its conviction of time what it is expecting of the moment so many ways attention can move but ultimately when it moves everything is rendered by it in meaning you know it's like the purpose of the past was get to, to get to the present and the purpose of the present is to be an endless revelation of the future with as if our intelligence is endless it's like uh, it's like our the space that is being our moment is like a drop in the oceanic space of being of, of how everything's being we are the presence of the worlds that we move in and move us to something new. There's this Tibetan sage by the name of Tiloba. I'll read a few quotes on it. And uh, end this off. Tilopa says, let go of what has passed, let go of what may come, let go of what is happening now. Don't try to figure anything out, don't try to make anything happen, relax right now and rest. Tilopa says, stop all physical activity and sit naturally at ease, remain silent and let sound be like an echo, do not think about anything, uh, look at experience beyond thought, open minded like space, let go of control and stop and rest at ease in that state, awareness without projection is the greatest meditation, train and develop like this and you will come to the deepest awakening. That deepest awakening is not a, an, an intelligence that is considering itself uh, to be powerless when it comes to the realm the power of it's poetically like the soul's power is coming from what it is uh, being drawn by that is beautiful in the world you know what I'm saying it's as if there's something about life that by by how it's present it's calling the attention forth to occur in the moment right it's as if we are being sculpted by the universe and we're just realizing it. anyways guys thanks for listening uh, wonder about your uh, realize and you know or I'll say it this way when you find your realize you're realized much blessings and I'll see you.